Uh, let's uh, start the second session. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Jorgen Andersen from uh, Aarhus uh, University in uh, Denmark. Uh, he's really a mathematician. He uh, has been working on topological ge ge quantum geometry of modular space. And today, uh, his talk topic is about uh, folding of proteins and RNA using the quantum topology of modular space. Let's welcome the speaker. <laughs> So thank you very much for inviting me here. The thanks goes to Stephen and Dika for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be back in Hong Kong again. And so um, what I'm going to try to, f to tell you about is our sort of endeavors towards understanding protein and RNA folding and try to predict it using some rather advanced mathematical tools. Uh, and so uh, therefore, maybe let me just first uh, just give you a very quick uh, rundown of uh, my center. Uh, I have a center funded by the Danish National Research Foundation in Denmark. Uh, uh, and uh, we have um, actually eight by now, but there are seven right here, permanent professors at the center. Just hired a new guy who hasn't quite made it to our webpage yet. He's coming. Very happy about that. He's hired from Oxford. And uh, we have a number of postdocs and PhD students. And just to somehow illustrate what was uh, said before is that this guy is working on biology. So as opposed to all of your teams who are all working on biology, our endeavor into biology is not that big. Um, they all work in quantum geometry of moduli spaces one way or the other, but it has relations to biology. And so Yuki is working in that direction. Uh, we have international collaborators, and so the first group of collaborators really stems from my time at, uh, at uh, Berkeley, uh, and so that's uh, Resitikin and Frankel and uh, Uru. And then we also have uh, a good big activity in Paris, joined with Maxim Kontsevich, and then Bob Penner. And Bob Penner and I are somehow really the ones that initiated this uh, uh, collaboration that I'm going to talk about. He also works on biology and, in fact, also on morphogenesis that we just heard about. And then, uh, well, since I was doing my PhD in Oxford, I also know these guys. And uh, that's uh, Nigel Hitch and Dominic Joyce and Alexander Ritter. And so they're also part of the center. And then when we got the center extended, uh, we joined uh, Caltech to the group. And so there is uh, uh, Ugori, uh, Gukov, and Kapustin from, uh, from Caltech, who's also part of the center. But we mainly do math and physics. But nevertheless, let me now talk about biology. So uh, l let me just do sort of the, the talk will have eight parts. Uh, I'll start talking about RNA secondary structures and pseudonauts. I will then deviate into quantum field theory and Feynman diagrams. I'll come back and talk about prediction of RNA pseudonauts from, from primary sequence. I will then turn to proteins and talk about geometry of H bonds and proteins, something we did some time ago. And then I will talk about how that inspired a lattice gate, gauge model, lattice gauge theory model for proteins. I'll talk about predicting this H-bond geometry de uh, descriptor from the local graph patterns. I'll then move on to predictions of protein secondary structure graphs from the primary sequence. And at the end, I will give you a speculation on relations to quantum theory. So let's get started. First part. So. Um, as you probably all know here, you know, the RNA folding problem is really to start with the primary sequence of some RNA and to predict the 3D tertiary structure of the folded RNA. However, for RNAs, uh, there hasn't been that many, you know, th true 3D structures known where you know the atomic location of all, you know, all the, all the coordinates of all the atoms. But what has been sort of really uh, a big thing in, in RNA is that people have known the secondary structure. And therefore, most of the research on RNA sort of folding predictions have actually just been to try to understand how do I go from the primary sequence to the secondary sequence. The secondary sequence is simply just telling you who is hydrogen bonded to who in the folded RNA. And so it's much more combinatorial on a topological problem. 
It's much easier to imagine trying to predict this than it is to predict all the 3D atom locations, say, of 10,000 atoms that are, or 100,000 atoms that are in this RNA. Okay, so that's the secondary RNA folding problem. Just try to predict who's hydrogen bonding to who from the primary sequence. And there has been a lot of uh, success on this. Uh, so, you know, if you look at a, the secondary uh, structure, of course, I can uh, picture it like an RNA diagram, and these are going to play an important role in this talk. So there I just imagine that the backbone is laid out along the x-axis, and then I just draw these arcs above if they are hydrogen bonded. And so some sites are unbonded, they're just represented by dots, and others are bonded. And so if this diagram has no arcs crossing, as you can see this diagram doesn't have, then there is actually a very nice uh, RNA secondary structure folding algorithm by Mike Waterman, which was uh, uh, it's something he did about 40 years ago by now. And so let me just show you the combinatorics of that. It's very simple. So the first step that I'm not really going to talk about is you can actually generate these guys where there are unbonded slots from just what's called a reduced secondary structure where there are no unbonded slots at all. So it's not so hard to sprinkle in these unbonded shots in between this. And so the whole issue is how do you generate these? So what you like to do is have an algorithm that generates all the structures, you compute the free energy for all of them in some nice recursive way, and this way you predict which is the structure. So it's very important to be able to rec recursively construct all diagrams. And so there is this very, very simple trick, which is very easily seen if you look at the diagram drawn this way. What you simply do is you just take hold of the first arc, you remove it, and you cut at the end point of that arc because you see that that will take an RNA diagram to two new RNA diagrams. And so thereby you have a recursion. And if your energy function is such that the energy of this guy is the sum of the energy of that guy and the energy of that guy and some contribution for connecting them, you're really in business. You can use this algorithm or this recursion to compute the energies. And that's indeed what people have been doing. This has been working really, really well. And people are predicting very well RNA secondary structure, provided there is no crossings of the arcs. Now, in terms of numerology, if you consider uh, the number of arcs, uh, not so number of diagrams with n arcs, and their sort of reduced secondary structures like this, what you see is that this recursion here exactly tells you that uh, let me call them C0 for some reason that you will learn in a second. But C0 of n is this number of diagrams. And you can see from this recursion here that uh, you get the following recursion because the first arc can go in and enclose, say, i arcs on this side and n minus i arcs on the outside. And therefore, all you've got to do is just decide how many are inside and how many are outside, and then do this recursion here. You see i is, and n minus i is always less than n plus 1 here, and therefore this formula tells you how to compute the number of these diagrams recursively. Now, the only diagram there is with zero rocks is, of course, the empty line. So that's our starting condition. And so, indeed, this is exactly the recursion that the Catalan number satisfies. And therefore, you know, if you make the usual generating function for these, where you take the number of diagrams with n arcs and you take set to the n, you exactly see that this function here set is, is, is given explicitly like this when it satisfies this recursion. This is well-known classical math and so on. Beautiful thing because it's really a very efficient way of generating all diagrams. Now, that's all good and well. However, there are many RNAs for which there are crossing arcs. So I think this one is the kind of yeast for some uh, special uh, uh, organism. And indeed, you see that it has crossing arcs. And the problem is that suppose I took hold of the first arc here and I tried to do exactly what Mike did, just remove it and cut on the end. The result is not disconnected. The result is still connected. So I don't get two new diagrams of the same type. I now all of a sudden get a diagram on two backbones, but they cannot be separated out, and therefore I don't get the same recursion. 
So the this, this, this simple uh, trick that Mike Waterman devised doesn't work. And uh, so, so in biology, these are called RNA uh, pseudonauts. Uh, I'll simply just call them RNA diagrams. Uh, but the thing is that uh, Lungser and Peterson at the Danish Technical University in the year 2000, they actually showed that when you consider all of these guys in one go, the whole RNA pseudonaut folding problem becomes NP-complete. So that means we don't have any existing good algorithm for folding pseudonauts at the moment. We don't know if P is equal to NP-complete, right? But if we do, then we would have, we'll be fine. But we don't at the moment. So then what? Well, this is sort of uh, the point where, where we started trying to think about this. And since we are mathematicians and physicists, we took inspiration from physics. And so uh, here we go. Now to something completely different, quantum field theory and Feynman diagrams. So let me just uh, start uh, by, by reminding you that the modern picture of matter and fundamental forces, including strong and weak forces and electromagnetism, but without quantum gravity, are described by the standard model. The standard model has just seen tremendous successes, right? Because the standard model is not consistent unless it has the Higgs mechanism and predicting the Higgs boson. And indeed, in CERN, they have in 2013 verified that the Higgs boson is there. Now, how are these uh, theories devised? I don't want to somehow try to go all into all details, but the point is that one wants to compute certain observables of various quantities and expectation values of these observables, and they are obtained by integrals of this form here. These integrals here are over infinite dimensional spaces, so mathematically they don't make sense. We don't know how to define them today. However, well, let me just show you that it's no simple matter. Here is the Lagrangian we have in mind for the standard model. So it's a huge Lagrangian with a very complicated theory and so on. And down here you see the Higgs mechanism. So you see the Higgs term, which is responsible for the Higgs boson and the generation of mass. So it's a beautiful quantum field theory that they have worked on for a long time and they know how to compute with this. And the physicists really love it. Uh, it's a gauge theory. But how do the physicists actually compute these integrals? Well, there we have to go and ask the guy who invented these integrals, Richard Feynman. So what Richard uh, Feynman said was, well, let's uh, look at the Lagrangian. And typically, Lagrangian has some coupling constant in front of it. And so what we are going to try to imagine is that the answer we want, so the expectation values we want, can be written as a sum of contributions where we have some kind of power series in this uh, coupling constant here, Planck's constant, and some coefficient in front here. And so it, nowadays, even the way they work in CERN is that they have no idea whether this thing here really exists. But what they do is they know how to compute these quantities here, the coefficients. It's actually interesting that uh, if you go and go on and compute more and more coefficients, you will see the coefficients are exploding. So this, the more terms you insert in this, the, the worse it gets. But only after a certain while, because to begin with, the number of terms are going down and approximating the true thing more and more. But if you continue, it will actually explode. Anyway. The thing is that the, the key point about this is that how do you get at these terms? Well, these terms can all be written as a sum over a finite set of fat graphs, certain kinds of graphs. So a fat graph is the same as a graph, except that at any vertex, there is a cyclic ordering of the edges that comes into the vertex. That's what a fat graph is. That's important because I'm going to use the term fat graph a lot. So a, graph, a fat graph is a graph together with information of cyclic orderings of the edges coming into each vertex. So the point is that these, co these coefficients we talked about before, they have an expression as a sum over a certain finite set of fat graphs. And the important thing is, if I just go back here, the, the distance you want to go into the sequence is governed by something called the genus of the fat graph. So the higher the genus is, the less it contributes in principle. 
So it starts with genus zero, which are the most important ones, and then genus one and so on, and two and so on. And so you're summing over a finite set of fat graphs of genus T, and then the, the specific graphs you have they may depend further on the theory. We're not going to remember that, but we're just going to remember that there is a genus to these fat graphs, and I'm going to tell you what it is in a second, and that we are summing over things of the same genus only. And the contributions for these fat graphs, so the con E of, of gamma here, they are mathematically well-defined. So each of these uh, uh, you know, constants that go into this series that we saw here, they are well-defined. It's not easy to make them well-defined. In fact, it, one has to do renormalization of the theory and so on, but that's part of the usual game. And so therefore, although we don't know how to really make an expression for this, what we will do is just take the mathematically sound formula for these and try to sum this series and stop after some, we don't sum all the way up to infinity, we sub subway into the series. And you know, this really works. I mean, they can predict, you know, the things they measure with 10 decimals uh, precision. So it's not hocus pocus somehow, although it's mathematically hocus pocus, but, you know, it works. So the idea that we want to take away from this is could we maybe find a quantum field theory whose fat graphs in the Feynman expansion are fat graphs or diagrams like these? e.g. pseudo-knot diagrams, or maybe produce a quantum field theory which can model RNA and protein folding. So that's the main idea that we're going to try to take away from this. And so at any rate, all I want to actually just learn from this right now is that there is this genus of such a, a pseudo-knot diagram. Let me now actually tell you precisely what this genus is. So now I switch back to a prediction of RNA pseudo from primary sequence. So, uh, just want to uh, show you the references on the papers that we have uh, written on this. And, uh, you know, it sort of varies from some semi-mathematical journals uh, to actual, you know, really biology journals and some physics journals. And it also includes some of sort of the top level math journals. And we got a whole issue of a certain journal dedicated to the whole work. So, so we're very happy about that. So the math community seems to be embracing this, I mean, on the sort of really pure side. So we're very happy about that. But uh, one guy you should really notice here is Bob Penner, because Bob and I are somehow the two guys that reoccur on, on all of these papers. OK. So what is this genus? Well, take an RNA diagram like this. And then you just imagine that it's lying in the plane like you see it. And then you reduce the fat graph structure from the plane. That means you just def define a little skinny surface that runs along the edges. And when you see the vertices here get coming with the edges coming in, you just draw it planar like this. So that's this little surface, a little skinny surface that you have associated to any RNA diagram. So when you have such a surface, well, the classification of surfaces says that uh, all the, the only thing you have to know is that whether the surface is oriented or not, all of these surfaces will be oriented. Then you have to know two things. You have to know the number of boundary components the surface has, and you have to know the genus. Then you know the surface up to classification, up to diffeomorphism. So let's have a look here. So in this case here, there is the dark, blue, dark, dark black uh, boundary component like this, and then there is the light one that runs like that. So this guy here has exactly two boundary components. And so the genus is by definition one minus a half times one minus n, where n is the number of arcs, plus r, and r is the number of boundary components. So when you feed uh, one, two, three, four, five as n in here, and two boundary components here, what you will get is that this guy has genus two. So that's the genus of an RNA diagram. Now there's a little nice fact about these things, is that 
if you have an RNA diagram with no crossing arcs, that is exactly mathematically equivalent to G being zero. So it's if and only if. So the genus zero diagrams is, in other words, the one that Mike uh, Waterman dealt with. It's the first in the language of quantum field theory in the perturbation order. So they're sort of the zero level of the theory. But we very well know from quantum field theory, you cannot just take the, the, you know, the leading order term. You have to adjust it by the higher order correction terms to get the right answer. And so therefore, it's important now to simply say, let's actually now filter the RNA diagrams by a genus. So that's what we started doing. We said, OK, let's actually not look at all of the diagrams in one go, because we know that's NP complete. Let's actually try to focus on the classes one genus at a time. So in terms of numerology, I'm now going to define CG of n to be the number of reduced RNA diagrams of genus G with n arcs, just like I did with C0 before. Okay. Then I'm going to produce the generating function, like this. And now I would like to understand, first of all, before I start understanding how to generate all the diagrams, I would like to know how many diagrams are there, how do they behave as a function of G and n, and so on. OK. So in order to do that, I have to introduce a new concept, which is called RNA shape. And an RNA shape is a reduced RNA diagram. So reduced just means that it doesn't have any of these guys here. It doesn't have any unbonded guys. That's reduced. Remember that. So therefore, A does not qualify for a shape. Every stack size, now what is a stack size? A stack size is simply a set of parallel chords with nothing, nothing in between the two ends. So for example, this is a stack size of two, this guy is a stack size of three, this is a stack size of two. So every stack size has to be one. So that means this, this, this also disqualifies A, it also disqualifies B because there's stack size two here. It doesn't disqualify C and D because there are no stack sizes that are bigger than one here, right? There are no parallel chords or parallax, sorry. No one arc. So a one arc is something like this. I don't want a one that just comes back to the, to the, the guy next, next after it. There are biological good reasons why we avoid those, but also mathematically good reasons. And then finally, a little bit technical, I want that it has a rainbow. A rainbow is one arc that starts from the first node to the last node. This is a technical reason. But so a shape of an RNA is, of the, is, by definition, a guy who satisfies all these constraints. Every stack size is one, no one arcs, but it has this rainbow over. So C is the only guy that qualifies for that. OK. So what I can do now is I can do a similar enumeration of those guys. So I'm going to define SG of n to be the number of RNA shapes of genus G with n arcs. And I'm going to define a generating function just as we have done before for those numbers. Now I'm going to try to understand how are their relation to the all the diagrams of genus G. And so it turns out that there is this very nice, beautiful formula that tells you that if you know SG, you can actually compute what CG is given that you know C0. And remember, C0 was this thing that was given by the Catalan numbers, so we know that guy already. So therefore, I will actually be able to compute how many diagrams there are of a given genus, depending, I mean, the whole generating series of those, depending on the number of, of, of arcs, right? Uh, that is, that's the power of Z, just by this kind of simple insertion. And in fact, no longer this. If you look at the proof down here, this proof actually is an algorithm that tells you that if you start with a shape if you start with a set of shapes, you can actually generate all diagrams of genus G in a very simple way. So let's look at a shape again. So for example, take this, this guy here. What you have to do in order to generate, so to, let's take this guy here. Uh, actually, sorry, this guy here, because that's the shape. What you need to do in order to generate all genus one diagrams, because this guy has genus one, is the following. You just take the three arcs that you see here. And then you cable them. First, you cable them up to size j, where j is any integer running from 1 to infinity. Then you put 
a little C, a genus zero diagram for him in front of the first point where this edge ends and the last uh, point where the edge ends. So you do this for all three of them. You cable them to size j, and then for in front of each of those resulting j arcs, you put an arbitrary C, a genus zero diagram in front, in both ends. So this is, if I just go back and show you the formula here, when I take this insertion here and just use the equation that C0 satisfies and rewrite the whole thing, you see it's a sum j equals 1 up to infinity of z to the j and C2 to the 2j. So that's exactly what it says here. What you do is you take any element from, uh, that is a shape, you uh, take and inflate each of its arcs to a stack of cardinality j, and then you insert a genus zero RNA diagram immediately preceding each of the resulting 2j arc endpoints. And then finally, this term here, you can also add a genus zero diagram to the end of that shape. Now this is a complete generation of all diagrams if you know how to generate shapes. So if I know somehow how to generate these guys, I'm in really good shape because then I can generate all the rest from those. So now the question is, have we seen these RNA shapes anywhere before? Well, let, us, let me just show you some of them. So for example, if the genus is zero, the only shape there is is the empty line with no quartz on it. So that means that the generating function for genus zero guys is one. The genus one guy, well, there are actually four of them. Here I've drawn them without the rainbow. I'm sorry, there should have been a rainbow over, but I didn't have my graphic tools with me here. So they are drawn without the rainbow, but there are exactly four guys that are shapes. You see this guy here corresponds to the set to the three term because there are three arcs, the two you see and the rainbow I forgot. These two guys here have four arcs, the three you see plus the rainbow I forgot. So there are two of them. So that gives you two times set to the four. And then the last guy here has five arcs, the four you see here and the rainbow, and there's only one of them. And so that gives you set to the five. So the generating function for the shapes of genus one is just that. So it's not a huge, I mean, sort of, it, it's a finite set. And so all diagrams of genus one, for example, is generated from these by the expansion process I just told you. It gets more complicated if G is two, what you see is, or what I didn't draw all the diagrams. It's uh, quite a long list. We have them drawn, but it's this guy here and it explodes quite quickly. But the thing is, how do we somehow understand these shapes? So have we ever seen them somewhere in math before? And so uh, we have actually, but, uh, but this is a, a discussion that goes back to this guy. So this guy is George Friedrich Bernard uh, Riemann. Uh, he's a student of Gauss. And in 1860, so yesterday we were taken back to, I think, 1910, seven or something like this, but now we go another uh, 50 years further back. He is sort of, in many ways, the guy who is responsible for the birth of, of sort of modern geometry as we know it today in terms of manifolds and so on. And he actually understood what's called the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with S number of mark points on it. So it turns out all such surfaces, they have uh, hyperbolic structures and uh, the whole set of hyperbolic metrics is acted upon by a certain group and the quotient space uh, is his moduli space. It's the sort of mother of all moduli spaces, the first moduli space ever considered. And uh, it's actually the one that's relevant for one plus one dimensional quantum gravity. I will come back to that in a second in, the, in sort of modern language. But, uh, but it's just a, a, a very nice space. He figured out what the dimension of this space is, but he wasn't really able to construct it mathematically precise. You know, this space here is infinite dimensional and this group here is also infinite dimensional. So what do you actually get when you take an infinite dimensional space divided by an infinite dimensional group? Well, uh, there's a good answer to that nowadays. So in the 60s, uh, David Mumford actually constructed this moduli space and its compactification. And it is a complex smooth orbifold, or more precisely, a Delin-Mumford stack. 
And this was done in the 60s. Uh, and this was really one of the first examples of the theory he had just invented, which is geometric invariant theory. And so uh, he got the Fields Medal for that. Uh, so um, in this room, I don't need to explain what the Fields Medal means, since we have steam among us here. So people know, but in many other branches, maybe they don't know. But uh, that's a shame. Anyway, uh, following that, a student of uh, Bill Thurston in Princeton, Bob Penner, which we have seen before, uh, actually created a cell decomposition of this space here. So this, the topology of this space is very, very complicated. But what he was able to do was to write this guy here as a disjoint union of cells. Now, cells just means the real numbers lifted to some power. So just the space, there absolutely no topology whatsoever. It's just the real line cross the real line cross the real line, you know, R1, R2, R3, and R4, and so on. It's Euclidean space of some dimension. And those pieces of Euclidean space are stuck together in a very interesting way. And the combinatorics of how they're stuck together is governed by connected fat graphs with S univalent vertices, all other vertices of valency at least three, and of genus G with S boundary components in bijective correspondence with the S univalent vertices. So S here is the same as the S of mark points up here, and G here is the same as G there. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between this cell structure and moduli space and then these fat graphs. But so the question is, how is that related to what we had before? And uh, here's the answer. So if you have a G that's bigger than or equal to 1, there is a bijection between RNA shapes of genus G and connected fat graphs of genus G with a single boundary component, each of whose vertices is of valency at least 3, except for a single vertex of valency 1. And the correspondence is very, very simple, but, but what, I'll give it here in a second. But, so what it says is that RNA shapes of genus G are in bijective correspondence with cells in Riemann's moduli space of genus G with one mark point. So we were really, really thrilled when we saw this because this was mapping our RNA problem onto something we really understand extremely well in geometry and topology, namely this, this kind of fat graph structure of this moduli space. So what is the correspondence? So if you take an RNA diagram like this, which is a shape, it's in fact the shape of genus one, right? It's one of the three, four guys we saw before, with, now with the rainbow on it, it's important. What you do is you collapse this line here to one vertex, then you get this graph here, and then you do what's, what is called taking the dual, or taking the Poincaré dual. That means the following. This, this guy here is just, re remember, representing a very skinny little surface where each arc has a little band around it, right? So it has boundary components. And for each boundary component of this graph, you draw a vertex. And if two boundary components share an edge, you join them by an edge. So the Poincaré dual of that graph is this graph. And this graph here indeed is a graph that has one univalent vertex, and then all the other vertices have valency at least three. And if you track around this guy, you will find that he has exactly one boundary component. And it's in bijective correspondence with that vertex. So they are exactly allowed. So that means we have mapped our problem onto a classical problem in, in topology and geometry, namely counting those guys here and constructing them. Well, great, because now we can look in the literature, because Hara and Sakia in 1986 actually solved the problem of computing the number of cells in Penner cell decomposition. And in fact, interestingly enough, they actually wrote their recursion exactly in the CG function we had before. So they went the other way, they started with the shapes, then they defined the shapes by this crazy formula we had before. So they started with the shapes, S, SG, which are the cells, then they made this combination, funnily enough, and then they showed that that combination is determined by this recursive formula on the coefficients. In fact, they went on to show more. Namely, if you look at the generating function for genus G diagrams, it is exactly of this form here. So where everything is known explicitly except for this polynomial, 
It's probably not so they're in all the genus information that's encoded in that, except for this simple way of behavior here. This polynomial has integer coefficients. It is of degree at most 3g minus 1. And then there are some further properties. I just want to highlight this. It starts at set to the 2g, and it goes up to, to set to the power 3g minus 1. So its span is g. Um, it has some more properties, but uh, the thing is that we have here tabulated the first five ones. And what you notice is that, uh, you know, what do you notice about these polynomials here? So in math, when you write, I want to emphasize the following. When, in math, when you write integer coefficients, you allow negative numbers. But these guys here, they don't, you don't see any negative numbers here at all. And the thing is, it's it sort of, so I, I want to mention one open math problem in this talk here. And the open math problem is about these guys here. Sorry, let me, so, okay, I'm, I'm going to get to that in two slides. But I want to emphasize, notice that all the examples here have positive coefficients. Okay. Now, how are these PGs related to the SGs we had before? Well, they're actually related and absolutely straightforward. So the SGs can be computed explicitly by this very nice formula from the PGs. So what you see is that if you look at the, at, at the PGs like this, there is this kind of special insertion you have to do to the PGs to get to the SGs. Now, the SGs have positive coefficients by definition because the SGs are generating functions for shapes. So this is strongly indicating, right, this formula here that there is some other class of diagrams that the PGs are counting. And when you somehow make some kind of operation that mirrors this kind of insertion to those diagrams, you get all the shapes. And this we don't know, so I wrote it here as a conjecture. So I said that the polynomials has all its coefficient positive integers in the range from 2g to 3g minus 1, and is the generating polynomial for some as yet unknown set of classes of diagrams. So if somebody can crack this problem here, I would be very interested, because I think it can strongly improve the runtime on our algorithms if we understand the PGs as opposed to the SGs. Because notice that the PGs has a much smaller spread. The spread of this guy here is about 5G, whereas this is G. So if there are any youngsters, and I see a number of people in the audience who fits this, um, let me know if you can crack this one. In fact, all of you are welcome. Okay. Let's see here. Yes. So that's great. Math actually gives us some of the answers that we really want here. Now, the question is, does this actually really work for biology? Okay, so let's, let's talk about that. So for that, we have to talk about RNA sigma structures. Because remember that uh, shapes were the kind of structures where you didn't see any twos or threes like this in parallel. But that's, of course, extremely non-biological because RNA likes to fold just like DNA does in superhelices or this, this, this helix, right? And so you almost never see just one connector like this. You see a stack of hydrogen bonds for a while, then it breaks the pattern, makes new uh, stacks in other directions. So therefore, it's totally unbiologically to just enumerate those guys. What you should be able to do is you should be able to control the stack size. And also, this guy here is not really at all allowed in, in biology because, because of sort of the way that the whole chemistry is built. It cannot bend back on itself and hydrogen bond itself one, one go over. So therefore, what we did, we defined a new class of RNA, RNA diagrams where we control the stack size. So we asked that the stack size is minimum sigma, where sigma can be any number you like, and there are no one quarts. So for example, A here is not an RNA2 structure just because it has this one here. But if you remove that, then you actually have an RNA2 structure. But you don't have an RNA3 structure because these two guys are stack size 2, right? Uh, like, actually, the only guy that really fits the whole definition is this guy here, B. That's an RNA2 structure. But not an RNA3 structure, although these guys have stack size 3, this guy only has stack size 2. Okay? C 
and D are not RNA two structures, they are RNA one structures. Okay, now the question is how do we enumerate and how do we generate such diagrams? Because those are the ones that are relevant for biology. Well, the thing is that if we now define, uh, you know, D sigma N to be the set of RNA sigma structures on N vertices, and this D G comma sigma of N is the subset consisting of such structures of genus G. Then, of course, we can make a corresponding generating function. We can take the number of such diagrams and put it into a generating function. And it turns out that the generating function for these has a very simple formula in terms of just the substitution out of CG. You simply just make this simple substitution here where U sigma of Z, the one that depends on sigma, is this explicit function here. And this kind of substitution we understand on the level of construction of diagrams. It's just done by a similar method as I talked about before where you just cable shapes up to the necessary size. And so, this in particular means that we can run through all diagrams in an iterative way, in an efficient way for given genus. And that means that we have a corollary of this theorem here because this comes with an algorithm that we have a minimum free RNA, minimum free algorithm for generating all RNA structures of a fixed genus. Um, so what am I saying here? Yeah, the minimum free energy RNA structures can be computed uh, in polynomial time for fixed genus. So that means that the genus is really important because if we stratify the diagrams by genus, we have a new situation. It's no longer NP complete. We actually have polynomial runtime algorithms that can uh, do this. So the key thing was actually just to introduce the genus and filter the problem by genus and then we get a new solution. Now the question is, does this work? And so let me just show you this. So we actually did program this into an algorithm we call gfold. The algorithm is O of n to the 6 in runtime and O of n in mem to the 4 in memory. And as you can see here, here are the previous uh, 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 um, three best algorithms for predicting pseudonauts. And we were able to beat them in sensitivity in, about, in terms of about 10% uh, and correspondingly in positive predictive power. But actually, sort of the way the whole thing is organized, we are actually able to compute probabilities for a given site, hydrogen bonded to another given site. And so when we, in, when we just look at things that have a very high probability of being bonded, our positive predictive power is, is, is approaching one. So, so it, does this improve the, the sort of situation for pseudonauts considerably? by using this, uh, this, this piece of math. So we were, we were happy about that. Um, I just want to show, come back to quantum field theory and actually show you a matrix model, which actually uh, is explicitly counting all diagrams. So uh, what you do is you say, let's, have a, let's do an integral over the n by n Hermitian matrices and what we're going to integrate is e to the minus n, where the size of the matrix, times trace of some potential, some explicit function of h. And what we are interested in is rewriting this in terms of what's called the free energies. So this is a well-known thing that people do all the time in quantum field theory and in matrix model theory. Uh, it sort of was invented by Tuft, uh, namely that he wanted to understand the large n limit when n goes to infinity here. And so the thing is that these guys here have formulas in terms of diagrams, in terms of Feynman diagrams in general. But the neat thing about the following is that if you take the following potential, so if you take the Gaussian potential and you deform it by this explicit expression here in S and T and X, you apply that up here, you do this matrix model and you do the asymptotic expansion of this, the theorem is that the free energies, which are now functions of S and T, is some constant we don't care about, plus and then the CGBs. And what are the CGBs? CGB is the generating series for the number of genus G reduced RNA diagrams on B backbones. So, so far I've only been talking about B equals to one, but there is actually a matrix model that spits out all the numbers for any number of backbones. 
And of course, two backbones, for example, is very interesting for RNA, RNA interaction diagrams, right? And so on. So there is a very nice matrix model that completely explicitly spits out the number of diagrams. Uh, okay, let me just, uh, this, this work here was sort of in part inspired by the following developments. So, uh, and this is sort of um, a very strong link to, to physics. Namely, if we go back to Mumford and his construction of this, these moduli spaces, whatever they are precisely, but he constructed them in algebraic geometry, and he also, together with Delin, found a way to compactify these moduli spaces. And then these moduli spaces, they carry certain cohomology classes, which are called tautological classes. And it was a big problem in math, how to compute the pairing of these tautological classes against the fundamental class of this moduli space. Now, a lot of mathematicians spent a long time trying to do this. But uh, it wasn't until uh, this guy, Ed Witten, uh, actually discovered that these classes, they fit into a very nice quantum field theory, which uh, he called quantum gravity in one plus one dimension. And then he wrote down a path integral formula for them, and he conjectured they were given, this path integral would be giving these classes. And so that formed sort of half of the support for him getting the Fields Medal. And uh, I'm going to get back to the second half and, uh, later. But the guy who solved the problem also got the Fields Medal for solving it. This is Maxim Kontevich, which is also part of my center. And he uh, proved Witten's conjecture by actually writing down a matrix model. Is the matrix, the Kontevich matrix model. And this is a matrix model which computes these path integrals. And then he solved this matrix model by using Bob, Bob I mean, Bob Penner's cell decomposition of these moduli spaces. So matrix models in relation to these cell decompositions, already well-known game in mathematics. And so this matrix model is computing intersection numbers, but we found this other matrix model which actually computes number of cells as opposed to intersection numbers. So there's lots more territory and possibilities to explore these relations further. Let me leave it at that. And now I'm going to switch to the geometry of hydrogen bonds. And I think we have to speed up a little bit because is it right I have 12 minutes left or something like this? I think so. Anyway, um, this stuff here. So if you maybe feel a little bit lost in the math and moduli spaces, now I know what, here comes relief because if you didn't listen at all until now, you can answer the game right here. So what we did was we have looked at elementary way of looking at geometry of hydrogen bonds in proteins. And uh, this, we were very happy that we got that one uh, as a nature communication. So, uh, and it's really done in terms, uh, in collaborations between all these people are actually at Aarhus University and they are chemists and molecular biologists and so on. And we all somehow under what's called the iNano Center in Aarhus. But let me show you what it is. So first of all, I just want to motivate that the protein folding problem is of course to try to predict now the really the 3D structure from the primary sequence. And so if we look at a protein, we have its backbone, which goes C, N, C alpha, C, N, C alpha, C, N, C alpha all the way down. It starts with an N in this end and it ends with a C in that end. And so it is partitioned into what's called peptide unit. The ith peptide unit starts at the ith C alpha, goes C, I, N, I plus one, C, I, alpha plus one. So you see the first guy here. The nice thing about these planar, uh, these peptide units are actually they're virtually planar. We're going to exploit that heavily in a second. So, uh, something very classical that has been studied for a very long time is the geometry along the backbone in terms of Ramachandran angles and Ramachandran plots. So these are just two dihedral angles, phi and psi, that you measure at the two bonds prior and after C alpha. And this, in principle, if there was perfect tetrahedral symmetry around the C alpha, gives you the progression of the backbone. Omega here is the deficiency from being planar for this peptide unit, which is very, very small statistically. And so you can plot these in Ramachandran plots, and you know basic motifs for proteins. So for example, alphas are around here, betas are around here, and so on. This has been used extensively, and it sort of underlies secondary structure of proteins. But there hasn't really 
being any good low-dimensional description of the geometry around hydrogen bonds, which are not along the backbone, but which are across, right? They are hydrogen bond connecting one piece of the backbone to another piece far off. And so this is what we provided. So what we said is, okay, this peptide unit is planar, and it has a preferred direction in it, so that means I get a frame of, of R3 from it. Because I can take a unit vector along this direction, I can take its orthogonal component in the plane, turning uh, 90 degrees in the positive direction on this plane here, and then I can take their cross product, that's a third vector, these three guys is an orthonormal basis of R3, and so I get a frame of, that's what's called a frame of R3. And the frame of R3 is described by a 3 by 3 matrix because it's uh, three vectors of size 3, so you just stack them one after the other as columns in the matrix. So that's a frame. There's just three vectors of unit norm length. They're all orthogonal. Okay. Now, if I have two peptide units, then actually there is a unique rotation which carries the frame for the ith peptide unit to the jth peptide unit. And it's described in terms of these matrices here, the frames. It's just written like this. That's the rotation that takes one frame to the other. There's a little problem with this. Namely, if I take the entire protein and rigidly rotate it in three space, this guy here will, not, will change because I will conjugate this rotation by that rotation I rotated the whole protein by. So therefore, this guy is not such a good a descriptor because it depends on how the crystallographer, crystal, crystallographer puts the protein in three space. And we don't want to be dependent on that, of course. But if you do the following, and that's sort of a well-known thing in lattice gauge theory, you gauge the problem. That means you take, the rota you take the two guys, here's one peptide unit, here's another peptide unit. I have the rotation up to this, and I have rotation up to this. If you take the entire protein and rotate it in such a way that the first guy is in standard position, then this rotation here will be a good rotation description that is independent of how you rotate the protein in three space. So that rotation, so written, it turns out that it's just the product in the opposite order, that rotation is well-defined 3D descriptor. And I can associate that to any hydrogen bond because in hydrogen bond, say, goes from H to O, so I put, first put H in standard position, the peptide unit with the H, the donor, and then I measure the rotation over to the uh, oxygen, the guy with the oxygen. That's the descriptor we, we uh, put our finger on. Uh, and what we now did was actually to sample this. So, so that what the paper does is to say, let's look at all possible hydrogen bonds and then look at the subset that gives inside the space of all rotations when we vary over all hydrogen bonds, over all proteins. Now, we have to be careful about that because what we have to do is we have to go to the protein data bank. It contains many proteins. It contains 142,220 at the moment. What you have to do is you have to somehow curl the database so that you don't take oversample because the, it's not a uniform sample of all proteins. You have to sequence a line and blah, blah, blah. And also you have to use certain algorithms for selecting when there is a hydrogen bond. We chose the DSSP standard. And so what we do is we roughly get a million hydrogen bonds out of the protein data bank. And then here's the picture of them. This is a density plot. So remember that if you want to think about a rotation, then Euler's method is very nice. Uh, you take a rotation has an axis, so you take the axis and then you scale the unit vector in that direction of the axis by the amount you rotate. So zero means you don't rotate at all, a small vector means you rotate very little around the axis, and if you take pi, it's half rotation around that axis. So therefore, rotations become the same as the ball of radius pi inside three space where you just have to remember at the outer shell, rotating pi around this axis is, I mean, in, pointing in that direction, the same as rotating pi around pointing in the other directions. So on the shell, on the outer shell, you just have to identify antipodal points. So the space of rotations is the ball of radius pi with antipodal points identified. And so this, what you see here, is just take this ball and slice it in disks. Here we've chosen 81 slices and just compress the data for that little slice into a 
a picture on the disk. You see that the data clearly, five minutes, oh my God. Uh, you see that the data clearly has a clustering structure to it, right? It's not a uniform mess in the three sphere. Okay, so uh, here's sort of a plot from the side and here's another plot from another side. So there clearly is lots of structure to be understood here. So what we did was that we separated this data here into lengths along the backbone. So we looked at all the hydrogen bonds, we separated them according to the length along the backbone, and if they were long, that was lo longer than six away. So we had you know, plus two up to plus six, minus two up to minus six, and then another class called long. And then what we did was we clustered this data uh, once we had split it into to these classes here, I think I'm going to skip how we annotate these uh, clusters. It's not important really for this talk right now. I have plotted some of the clusters uh, in relation to these uh, uh, 3D plots we saw before. Here is the, the table of all the clusters we got. There are 30 clusters all together, and some of them correlate well with secondary structure, like, for example, the main bulk of uh, you know, half of the observations are here, and these really correspond to alpha helix bonds. And then some of those guys here corresponds to beta and so on. We discussed in many details how this is related to secondary structure. It's kind of a uniform view on both terms and secondary structures in proteins. But the point is that it's sort of, it's kind of discretized, the data. It's not uniform in SO3 at all when you vary over, over so many uh, hydrogen bonds. And so this somehow led to the following idea. So let's try to give a lattice gates theory model for protein structures. So what I mean by this, I mean the following. Take a protein in three space, like for example, the one that you see here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to build a graph for this protein. The graph will be the following. The vertices of the graph are the centers of the atoms along the backbone. That's the vertices. And then the edges are split in three classes, primary, secondary, tertiary. The primaries are corresponding to covalent bonds between the backbone atoms. That's kind of obvious that they should be there. You just follow the backbone around in the protein. That's the primary edges. The secondary edges come from hydrogen bonds, and the tertiary edges come from tertiary contacts between C alphas. So there's some way, various ways you can define this, but for any way of defining this, you will get some graph like this. So this is abstractly a graph that you can associate to a protein. And what you can now do is you can associate a moduli space to this graph. It's very standard in math to look at the following. You look at all possible associations of rotations to all the edges, and you divide by overall rotation of the whole thing. This space has actually what's called a holonomy map. It's a map from this moduli space to a smaller moduli space that just remembers what the rotation is along the secondary and the tertiary edges. And if we define MP to be the inverse image of one, so repeat one as many times as there are factors here in SO3, the identity, then this guy here is exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the 3D, possible 3D configurations of the backbone of the protein in three space. So that means we have a much larger space to work with, which is moduli space, and inside there we have a small thin sub-variety, which is the inverse image of one of H, and they correspond to the true protein structures that are possible. And so you could say, well, what's the need, of, what's the need for that? Because you just made the problem worse, because you just made the space bigger. But the thing is that by making the space bigger, I have an option to actually guess what the, hydrogen, what the rotations is for all the edges independently, and they may not fit to give some structure in three space. But I have a home for talking about independent guesses. So um, that's what I'm saying on this slide here, actually. So I'm just saying that if you have a mechanism that kind of predicts what the rotations are for the three different kinds of edges that you see here, then that can be considered inside this big moduli space. This is not a prediction that corresponds to any protein at all, because it may not be possible to realize this guy in three space, 
But then there's something, some technical stuff here I want to go over very quickly. There is a way to turn on a certain gradient flow that will flow this guy towards this sub variety which corresponds to genuine protein structures. So this allows us to say, OK, we are going to try to see if we can guess the rotations or predict them by some means independently for all the edges, and then uh, build the true stru a guess for the true structure from there. But then we can go further on and say, OK, what if uh, this graph, this just this abstract graph on its own, were actually determining the 3D structure of the protein to some accuracy? And so if that was possible, then we could reduce the, the folding problem to a simpler problem. Namely, first you take the primary sequence, then you try to predict the graph. From the graph, you predict all the rotations. You flow with this. Uh, um, gradient flow to an actual prediction. And so therefore, what we need to do now is we actually need to analyze whether the local structure of the graph actually determines the geometry of, say, the hydrogen bonds. And the geometry of the hydrogen bonds are described by this rotation. So in other words, we want to try to understand, if I just take a very small snippet of the graph like this, and I assume that that is known by some other mechanism, and I then want to see, can I determine what the rotation is here at the central A bond by just knowing the pattern of the hydrogen bonds nearby? And so this is actually what the next uh, section is about. We did indeed make this analysis. We isolated our patterns, and we tried to look, does the pattern locally determine the rotation? And indeed, statistically, it does so very well. In fact, 85% of all hydrogen bonds can be predicted within 0.1% of the volume of SO3, so a very narrow region. And if I go to 90%, I can predict 90% within 1% of the volume. So that means the local pattern of the graph actually determines what the rotation is. OK, so paraphrase, this means local topology determines the local geometry. And so, we believe that we have reduced the folding problem of proteins to a mainly combinatorial topological problem. In fact, a problem that is very similar to what we dealt with for RNA, namely what we're going to do is we have to figure out a way to predict just this RNA, similar to the RNA, we have to predict a certain fat graph uh, from the primary sequence. And so, um, very quickly, I just want to go through uh, that we are actually, right now with my PhD student Yuki, we're going through the analysis of associating uh, a fat graph to a protein, just like we did for RNA. So the thing is that each peptide unit gets associated this fat graph piece. They string together to form the backbone like this. And then you uh, make edges in this fat graph uh, corresponding to the hydrogen bonds, just like we did for RNA. And the result is a certain fat graph that represents sort of what we call the secondary guy because it only remembers the hydrogen bonds. And this guy, just like for RNA, has a genus. So we can filter the diagrams exactly the same way. And what we have so far is that we have a cut and join method which proves recursive enumeration formula for these guys. We have an algorithm which in polynomial time generates all the fat graphs of a bounded genus for given length on the backbone. We're working on producing minimum free uh, energy algorithms in analogy with RNA, which is applicable to these protein situations. OK, so, so that is sort of uh, as far as results are concerned in this talk. And so in the remaining minus uh, one minute, let me quickly go through a speculation. The speculation is as follows. Consider these moduli spaces. These moduli spaces actually form the two-dimensional part of a quantum field theory that Witten studied. This is the second reason why he got this Fields Medal. This, because he showed the following theorem. This quantum field theory actually reproduces the Jones polynomial. The Jones po polynomial fits into a T of T, he said, fitting the axioms of Atiyah and Siegel and himself. And so the Jones polynomial, which Vaughan got the Fields Medal for, except that he also, of course, worked on subfactors, uh, which gives you representations of break groups. Uh, this is going very fast, I know, but you don't need to understand much of the details so far. 
just to understand that there are some quantum field theories. And what this slide says is that there is a mathematical construction by Resetikin and Tureyev of this quantum field theory. And together with Kenji Ueno, I actually proved that the quantization of these modulized phases fit into this combinatorially constructed quantum field theory. Now, on top of this, there is this result by Mike Friedman and collaborators, uh, Kitaev, Larsen, and Wang, which states that the representations of the braid groups that comes, that fits into this TQFT is a theoretical universal quantum computer where the qubit number is related in a very simple way to the number of mark points that you need to have. So if you string all of this together, you end up with the following speculation. Consider these moduli spaces we have associated to these proteins. Well, the TQFT that we have just discussed, it associates certain, re certain representations to these moduli spaces of braid groups. And these representations are known to be universal quantum computers. So the quantization of the moduli spaces we have associated to proteins has this theoretical possibility. So question, is the quantization of these moduli spaces an effective description of some delocalized quantum states in proteins? Because if the answer to this question is yes, then we must conclude that every protein contains a large quantum computer. And if so, we should therefore ask the question, is there a substantial quantum computing software component to macromolecular biology? Does it mean that every protein runs around with a quantum computer programmed in various states? And when proteins are docking, they're exchanging quantum information, and it actually somehow is maybe programmed into the molecule to know whether it should dock with this protein or that protein, and can do various computations depending on need and density and concentration and feedback loops and what have you. I don't know. We are trying to interest physicists in this question here because they're probably the ones who can verify this. But I can remark that it is well known that certain proteins have very good quantum mechanical properties, like, for example, the photoelectric effect is a good example. And people thought early on that quantum states could not exist in such a noisy environment as proteins. But in fact, they're realizing that they are actually really good harbors for these quantum states in this photoelectric effect. So thank you very much for, for listening. So I have one uh, temporary question yep. about the free energy you mentioned, the minimum free energy for yes. RNA, uh, uh, say the topology. So, but uh, I'm uh, kind of coming from collaborator with chemistry, uh, from chemistry. Degree. Okay. Usually, uh, by uh, free energy, they refer uh, the uh, certain interaction with the environment. Yeah. And uh, what, how much probability you see the RNA, RNA structure with, with the interaction with the environment, for example, like the hairpin? Mostly you may see clearly the loop, but uh, you all also see other type of uh, maybe corresponding to your uh, field or something yes. structure. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you mention the minimal free energy, what's the difference between this uh, chemical type of free energy? Well, I think it's more or less the same, except that we try to uh, have certain uh, parameters which are supposed to specify the free energy of the RNA in, say, standard conditions. But, for example, if you put them in acid or something like this, these free energies would dramatically change their parameters. But the point is that what we do is, we, in order when we run these uh, algorithms, what we do is we take aside a certain amount of the RNAs, we train the parameter sets for the free energies on that small subset, and then we predict on the rest. So we do not actually measure the free energies in the lab. We train them statistically. OK, just count the how many. Yes, you, so you do it via you know, the probabilistic formulas of, uh, uh, for, for free energies. So we, it would be very nice if some people would measure. And I think if, as far as secondary structures is concerned, people actually have measured them, some of them, uh, for, for the RNAs which don't have crossing arcs. But as far as I know, nobody has actually tried to measure them for the ones where there are crossing arcs. Okay, 
So we just try to uh, tune the parameters. There are very few of them, four of them or something like this, depending on these four patterns that you saw for genus one, actually. So we tune those four parameters to be optimal on a small subset of the RNA structures, and then we guess on the rest and see how well we do. Yeah, actually, we have done some uh, molecular <coughs> dynamics before. Right. And uh, with, uh, say, 12, uh, 12 backbone uh, heritage RNA heritage. Okay. And we indeed saw, uh, we failed out the contact map. Uh -huh. That's the type of uh, uh, how, uh, if the two atoms, uh, backbone atoms, are very close, yes. in certain, say, a certain unstrong threshold, then we make a contact. Yeah. From the contact map, indeed, uh, there are some uh, pseudonyms. Uh, it's not just a simple uh, right. low. Yeah, okay. it may be distorted. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the most uh, highest of free energy, uh, I mean, most popular type of uh, structure we have seen in the simulation, of course, just in simulation, yeah. is this a simple genus zero type. So right. But uh, we do have other type of simulated uh, Right. Yes. And so that's sort of typical expectation is that the genus zero story is the main thing and then higher genuses is correction terms and some of this. Okay. So, so, so that's very similar to, to, to the way we think in physics also and the way that it fits in this case. It sounds interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. So now we kind of move to YMEM. Uh, structure for the, mm -hmm. for the protein or molecular, but uh, it's still associated with the free energy because once you take the camera, thousand of combination will be frozen simultaneously. That basically there are lots of clusters. I'm not sure whether this type of classification uh, may give us some uh, how much probable we can expect with the I certainly expect that it's get less and less probable as the genus goes up. That's okay. what we see. Other questions? Okay. Uh, if no question, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.